we see a great uh, audience here already. It's really exciting to see such positive energy and a large crowd already tuning in. And I'm sure in the next couple of minutes that will, will grow as well. But we, we really appreciate you being here tonight and being part of this community discussion. Um, just so everybody knows, uh, my name is Robert Nesbitt. I'm the county's Health and Human Services Policy and Operations Manager. And prior to serving in this role, I worked for more than eight years in homeless services with the county and with Roof Above, and I'll be the moderator for tonight's event. We have a full agenda with opening remarks, a presentation on the state of homelessness and the tent city, what we will be referring to as the North End Encampment, a community panel discussion, and then we'll outline the best ways for people to get involved. I know homelessness can feel daunting, even overwhelming, and we know that the North End Encampment has brought the reality of homelessness to the forefront of our community. Homelessness has been a problem in our community for many years, but now it is out of the shadows. There are no easy answers, but tonight we want to provide as much clarity as possible on what's next and the ways you can get involved. For everyone viewing at home, a large portion of tonight's town hall is dedicated to answering your questions. We received many questions before our event, and during tonight's panel discussion, you'll be able to submit questions through the chat box located at the bottom of your screens, or you'll also be able to send us your questions by email via townhall at mechnc.gov. That's townhall at mechnc.gov. We'll answer as many of your questions as we can tonight. Now, and for some reason, uh, you have to drop off of the event early, or if you know of somebody who wanted to attend and not able, uh, we are planning on doing a, a recording of this potentially. And, um, and yeah, it's just great to see you all. Just, we really appreciate it. I'd, I'd like to acknowledge that there are elected officials in attendance, and we appreciate you all joining. And now I will turn it over to our Board of County Commissioners Chairman, George Dunlap, to provide our opening remarks. Chairman Dunlap. Thank you, Robert. And I want to take this time to thank all of you who have joined us for our town hall on homelessness. The board and I have convened this event in response to the many emails and calls that we've received from the concerned community members. We want to engage you and ensure that your perspectives are heard, that your questions are answered. It's important to me that we work together to solve the problems and to create solutions. But before we get started, I want to take a moment to share with you why this town hall matters. It should not be a surprise to hear that homelessness was a problem in Mecklenburg County prior to us ever having a pandemic. Homelessness is not new to Mecklenburg County. It is also not new to communities across the United States. Homelessness, or put more simply, the circumstance in which someone does not have a roof above their head is deeply rooted in systems and structures that benefit some, but not for all. And homelessness has only worsened during COVID-19. I wanna take a minute and share a personal story about why this is so important to me. From time to time, I have the opportunity to take food to the kitchen. And on two occasions, I ran into people who I grew up with. Two people who were classmates of mine at South Mecklenburg High School. And it hurt me to my heart to see them in that condition. And so I have vowed that for whatever I can do, to make life a little better for them, I'm gonna do it. And I'll tell you one of the reasons why it's so important to me is because one of those two gentlemen came to my defense in seventh grade. Back then I was a pretty good ping pong player uh, and I won a lot and I had beaten this guy on the ping pong table and he wanted to fight and before I could do anything. This person jumped in and took care of business. And I've never forgotten that. And it is people who are in his situation that I feel called to help during this time. 
If you or someone you love has ever struggled to keep their home, you know firsthand how this feels. It can be scary. It can be traumatic sometimes even lonely. For me, the word is unacceptable. I believe that our community must and can do better to help our residents. Help them not only have a place to call home, but also for an opportunity to thrive. My hope is that by the end of tonight's town hall, you will have gained three things, a fuller understanding of the complexity of homelessness, and the efforts underway by Mecklenburg County to address these issues. Having your questions both heard and answered. And finally, a takeaway of tangible things that we can do to make a difference. Thank you for being a part of our efforts to end homelessness in Mecklenburg County. So at this time, I'd like to introduce our county manager, Dina Diorio. Thank you, Chairman Dunlap, and thank you everybody for being here this evening. As county manager, I am proud that Mecklenburg County has stepped up to support the work of promoting affordable housing. Affordable housing remains a priority both for the Board of County Commissioners as well as for me and my staff. During the past several years, we have established dedicated funding streams to close gaps in housing costs, supported affordable housing development on county owned land, increased our commitment to help prevent evictions and devoted new innovative housing programs that serve the most vulnerable in our community, such as MEC home and keeping families together. Along with housing, we know that some individuals experiencing homelessness need more intensive services to help them maintain it. So when the federal government stopped funding supportive services with housing subsidies, the county stepped up to fill that gap. But a comprehensive array of accessible behavioral health services is still needed for our community, particularly for people with little or no income. This problem cannot be solved by the county alone. The county invests more than $34 million in affordable housing, rental assistance, emergency shelter, and supportive services to help households both obtain and sustain housing. This includes $20 million from the county's annual base budget for fiscal year 21, and another $14 million from the county's rental subsidy fund that goes through fiscal year 2025. In response to COVID-19, the county utilized $6.8 million in federal relief funds for hotels to assist emergency shelters in meeting CDC and public health guidelines for social distancing, isolation, and quarantine. We also invested another $2.8 million for rental assistance to support households facing ev eviction due to the pandemic. This investment does not include the $1.3 million that the county gave to the local COVID-19 relief fund administered by the United Way. However, it is clear our community still has much work to do. The encampment in the north end of Uptown highlights many of the ongoing challenges that have resulted from long-term federal and state policies and budget cuts. These issues lack, include a lack of affordable housing and living wages, limited resources for individuals with significant behavioral health needs, and multiple barriers to housing for justice-involved individuals. In concluding my remarks, I want to be clear. Homelessness is not the fault of any one individual or entity. Solving homelessness is likewise not the sole responsibility of any single organization. It is up to all of us working together, local, state, federal, private, and faith partners to meet the needs of people experiencing homelessness. So thank you again for joining us. I hope tonight's town hall answers your questions and adds clarity about what is being done and what you can do to support these efforts. Thank you. And with that, I will turn it back over to Robert. Tina, thank you so much. Thank you, Chairman Dunlap. And uh, Dan, we're just going through some technical difficulties right now, getting this sorted out. We now are having a uh, poll question that will be coming up for our audience. But really quick, just want to check with our webmaster. Um, Dan, will you be able to turn on the cameras for people as they are presenting and speaking tonight? Cameras are either on for everyone or off for everyone. 
Okay, it well, look like it's selective based on the speaker, so we can go either way. Which would you like? Okay, we will um, we will uh, be figuring out the details with this these technical issues. But first, we we do want to start with an audience poll question, and that is: um, Have either you or someone you know and love experienced homelessness? Yes or no? And as these results are coming in, I do want to share that this poll question. It's a personal note for me. My uncle, my mom's only brother, dealt with homelessness for much of his adult life. Fortunately, he was able to secure housing near the end of his life with a lot of support from family and community resources. But there was nothing about his journey that was easy. And as I start to look at the poll results that are coming in, I can see that most people here have a personal connection to homelessness either experiencing homelessness themselves or knowing and loving someone who has. This serves as an important reminder of our common humanity that all of us are impacted by homelessness in some way. I would like to now introduce Stacy Lowry, the director of Mecklenburg County Community Support Services. Stacy will provide an overview of housing instability and homelessness, including the current state of these problems in Mecklenburg County and the efforts underway to address them. Stacy. Thank you, Robert, and good evening to everyone. My name is Stacy Lowry, and I serve as the Director of Community Support Services, which, much like the name suggests, exists to provide support to our community. We have four primary impact areas, homelessness, domestic violence, substance use, and services for veterans. Today, I'm here to talk about homelessness. Before we discuss the current state of homelessness in our community, there are some essential facts that we that are important to, know to fully understand the depth and breadth of the issue, and most importantly, the possible ways to address it. Fact number one, homelessness is a complex issue. What you see on the screen right now is a graphic that depicts homelessness as being on a continuum. On the left side are some categories of housing instability. These include housing cost burden, which means spending an unsustainable amount of one's income on housing. While households in these categories are not yet homeless, they are at high risk of becoming homeless. This means reducing or even stopping new entries into homelessness is an important component of our work especially during the pandemic, when housing is a prerequisite to shelter in place, isolate and quarantine. On the right side of the continuum are all the different types of homelessness. This includes unsheltered homelessness, such as people living in encampments, people in emergency shelter and transitional housing, individuals doubled up with family or friends, and families paying to stay week to week in hotels. And all the categories of homelessness are the faces of children, youth, veterans, and people experiencing chronic homelessness. Fact number two, because homelessness is such a complex issue, solutions must be tailored to address needs across the housing continuum. This graphic depicts our housing ecosystem. As the county manager mentioned, Mecklenburg County is engaged in every part of the housing ecosystem, from prevention to shelter, diversion, and housing. The ecosystem framework underscores the fact that an array of services is necessary to meet the needs of people on the housing continuum. We need prevention assistance to keep those struggling with housing instability from falling into homelessness. We need emergency shelter to provide beds when any loss of housing occurs. We need diversion assistance to maximize beds in our emergency shelter system. And finally, we need permanent housing that's available to households at all income levels. And lastly, fact number three, homelessness for any one person is actually the result of multiple systemic and structural factors that have existed since the founding of our nation and persist today. Addressing the core problems that contribute to housing instability and homelessness must therefore include the production of more housing of all types. Strategies to close the gap 
between income and housing costs, the willingness to fix systems that drive inequities and underpin discrimination, and the determination to enact policies that to support both renters and homeowners. As we shift to the current state of housing instability and homelessness in Mecklenburg County, I want to share some sobering statistics. There are at least 3,000 people who experience homelessness in a shelter, in transitional housing, or in an unsheltered location on any given date. This does not include the thousands of households who experience homelessness while doubled up with family or friends or are paying to stay in hotels. We are learning in the work in the North End encampment that many people are coming from hotels or doubled up with friends or family. During the last quarter of 2020, the North Carolina 211 system received over 1,600 calls for service from households at risk of or already experiencing homelessness. The average number of individuals experiencing chronic homelessness during the past fiscal year was 507. This population, which comprises just a subset of the overall population experiencing homelessness, is often also considered the highest need, having extensive histories of homelessness combined with a disabling condition. Before the COVID-19 pandemic, homelessness and housing instability were already increasing locally. The CDC eviction moratorium provided a pause in evictions, but only limited resources to address the long-term implications for at-risk households impacted by the pandemic. Based upon data and research conducted since the start of the pandemic, without wide-scale interventions, the trends we are seeing will, only, will only worsen, leading to a tidal wave of people becoming homeless. Housing remains the best antidote to homelessness. But the right housing fit means different things for different people. For most, an affordable housing unit is enough. For others who may have experienced long periods of homelessness, housing solutions may need to be paired with wraparound supportive services to address mental health, substance use, complex trauma, and physical health needs. We also need more landlords with affordable units to accept subsidies and to rent to people who have income and may have barriers such as criminal records or poor credit. Our panel tonight will share more information on the continuum of services and programs that are working to address the needs of people experiencing homelessness, as well as the targeted support for individuals experiencing homelessness in the North End encampment. I will now turn it over to Karen Pelletier, Business Manager with Mecklenburg County Community Support Services, to share more about how the county has stepped up to support the community during the COVID-19 pandemic. Karen? Thank you, Stacy. I will now highlight two of the topics that were of most interest to all of you. As Stacy just explained the complexities of homelessness, nothing illustrates those points more than that of the North End Encampment. Over the last 30 years, there have been a significant reduction in federal and state funding for both housing and behavioral health services. Wages have remained stagnant while the cost of housing has increased. At the same time, populations have grown and communities like ours have been unable to make up for this loss of investment and the lack of livable wages. And it does not take more than a drive on the Brookshire to see this reflected. It is important to note that people were experiencing unsheltered homelessness in Charlotte Mecklenburg, including in encampments, well before COVID-19. In fact, the January 2020 point in time count found that there were 170 people experiencing unsheltered homelessness on the night of the survey. This represents less than 15% of the overall home homeless population. In response to COVID-19, grassroots organizations and advocates stepped up to help individuals who were homeless and sleeping outside. Most of these efforts were focused around the Day Services Center 
located at Roof Above's North College Street campus. Soon after this began, people living in other homeless encampments wanting to be closer to these resources began migrating to this area along 12th Street, near North College and North Tryon Streets. People staying at emergency shelters also began visiting the area for fellowship and the additional meals being provided. You've heard a great deal tonight about the county's investment in emergency shelters, supportive housing, and affordable housing and rental subsidies. You may already be aware of this, but the county does not provide street outreach services. However, in order to help address the concerns related to the encampment, the county convened a group of stakeholders, which includes Roof Above, Salvation Army Center of Hope, Supportive Housing Communities, Cardinal Innovations, and CMPD. Although this group has since evolved, it was initially created to expand strategic outreach efforts and to improve data collection to gain a greater understanding of who is living at the encampment, what their needs are, and possible barriers to housing or shelter. Staff from across multiple agencies began formally collecting data specific to the encampment in November. And as of January 15th, there were 131 people who had been served in the North End encampment with 84 people currently living there. Data further indicate that 47 people have left with the majority of those exits being to emergency shelter. We also know that several of the men living there are accessing Roof Above's nightly winter shelter. All this highlights the transient nature of people experiencing homelessness. As people access resources, more people are in need of those resources. According to outreach staff and organizations, there have been no children found to be living in the encampment. This is because in part of the great partnership with Coordinated Entry and Salvation Army Center of Hope. Coordinated Entry staff are helping families seek alternative housing options and Salvation Army is helping families at their shelter move to housing programs in order to make space for other families falling into homelessness. The data show that many of the individuals in the encampment are living with some sort of mental health, substance use issue, or medical condition, and also lack access to health care. This underscores the need for Medicaid expansion in North Carolina in order to help people receive the appropriate level of care and treatment. As part of our panel tonight, Monarch will share more about what their role has been in the work to help connect people in the encampment to resources to meet their mental health or substance use needs. Dr. Jessica Salzman will also share what Atrium is doing to help people with medical needs of people experiencing homelessness. From this work, we have also learned of other resources available and organizations helping, including local grassroots organizations and members of the faith community and are excited about Black Love Charlotte serving as one of those organizations on our panel tonight. We've also learned that there are many other groups and individuals eager, eager to help, but there's a disconnect in how to make those efforts more impactful, safe, and efficient. We also know that many tents are being used for storage for people living in shelters or living in the encampment. Storage tents will continue to increase as long as clothing and household items continue to be dropped off there. Regarding the location itself, the encampment is on property owned by Morningstar, Roof Above, City of Charlotte, State DOT, and Verizon. Relative to the North End encampment, the county is not a property owner and therefore cannot enforce trespassing statutes which are outlined in the North Carolina Statutes Chapter 1422. This statute applies to private property, 
Therefore, it is up to the private property owner to enact enforcement options, such as calling upon code enforcement or local police to remove trespassers. Again, only property owners can request enforcement of ordinances for trespassing. I cannot stress enough that we all have a role to play in improving what is happening at the North End Encampment. The county appreciates all the work that has been done by volunteers, staff, and organizations. It is now time to strengthen our efforts. You will hear more about this from our panelists in a few minutes and from Deputy County Manager Anthony Trotman near the end of the town hall. Before the panelists join us, I will share information regarding our community's winter shelter plan. It is important to note that outreach staff continue to share how to access available emergency shelter beds with individuals living in the encampment. Due to the impact of COVID-19 on our community, shelters have had to adjust their winter shelter plans to meet CDC guidelines and the anticipated increase in demand that winter weather brings. Although the most noticeable change is related to room in the inn not operating this year, the overall shelter capacity has increased by a total of 273 beds. This net increase is the result of the county extending leases on hotel rooms, the reopening of roof above Statesville Avenue shelter, and Salvation Army Center of Hope utilizing Roof Above's newly purchased hotel as a winter shelter. In addition, during extreme weather, the county is positioned to provide additional resources to the shelters so they can expand capacity. Part of the winter sheltering plan includes Roof Above extending hours at its day services center for people who are unsheltered to access restrooms, hand washing stations, and outside radiated heaters in a manner that meets Mecklenburg County Public Health Guidelines. I will now turn the presentation back over to Robert. And thank you for your attention and your time. Thank you, Karen. That was a very informative and, and thoughtful overview. Thank you for, for sharing that with everybody and with the group. Just want to remind everybody, um, I see some hands raised that as, as part of the process tonight, we are having questions go into the chat box. So please submit any questions you have into the chat box or email mech in townhall at mechnc.gov. That's townhall at mechnc.gov. And we will now have our second poll question of the night before we transition to our panel of local providers. And you should see the second poll question now in your chat box. And that is what barriers keep households from accessing permanent housing? High cost of housing, income is too low, discrimination, criminal background, or all of the above. We'll give it just a minute as people enter in their responses. And again, I just want to thank everybody for working with us through the technical difficulties tonight and for your patience. Um, it's, it's great to see this large crowd here and, uh, you know, we're just just excited to be able to have this conversation. Let's so we'll give a little more time with the poll questions and we're seeing the results come in. And as we can see, most people have, have selected this answer. The answer here is, of course, all of the above, that most households experiencing housing instability or homelessness are usually experiencing a multitude or a combination of these factors. And that's just really how hard the struggle is. I mean, there's, there's no, there's often so many barriers that can prevent someone or contribute to someone experiencing housing or homelessness instability. So, um, so from there, we will now transition to our panel of local providers and who will share more about the different barriers that households face, as well as the resources that are available to help them. And uh, we have a great group of panelists here tonight, community experts in, in housing, homelessness, health care, uh, many of which, or really all of whom, serve the North End Encampment in some capacity. So as part of our panelists, we have Liz Clayson-Kelly, CEO of Roof Above, 
Deronda Metz, Director of Social Services at Salvation Army Center of Hope. Brittany Eaton, Director of Monarchs Assertive Community Treatment Team. Dr. Jessica Salzman from Atrium Health. We have Deborah Woolard, who is the founder of Block Love Charlotte. And again, we have Mecklenburg County Community Support Services Director, Stacy Lowry. And really appreciate all of you joining us for this conversation this evening. I'd like to ask that each of you have your cameras on so that you'll appear on the screen whenever you're speaking. And as, as part of an introduction, I'll ask that each of you describe how your organization supports people experiencing homelessness in the North End Encampment, what adjustments you've made to expand capacity to serve people experiencing homelessness, particularly in response to COVID-19, what you see as the most significant barrier to addressing homelessness in our community, and what are things people can do to support your organization in helping people living in the North End Encampment? And I know that's a lot of different uh, parts of the question, but if you could uh, have a three to four minute response for the answer, um, that will allow us to kind of get through and make sure everyone has time to introduce themselves. I'll um, call on each each person to respond, and we will uh, start with uh, Liz Clayson Kelly uh, to describe the work of Roof Above. Okay, good evening, everyone. It is wonderful to see this crowd. Um, thank you all for your interest in this issue of ending homelessness and unsheltered homelessness in our community. Um, as Robert said, I'm CEO of Roof Above. We are a homeless service agency that provides a wide continuum of services from street outreach, the day service center, emergency shelter, short-term housing programs, as well as permanent supportive housing, um, probably most well known for more place. Um, in terms of the encampment, so there's a few ways that we serve folks in the encampment. So one, um, you heard Karen speak about our day services center. So we're open 365 days a year. Uh, we have showers and laundry facilities. We receive mail for folks. We serve a lunch every day there. So there's lots of ways um, for many years we've been serving folks who are unsheltered. In addition, we have a street outreach team that actually goes out and works with people in the encampment, really with the focus on housing solutions. So our interest is how are we ending homelessness for people? So what can we work on um, to get people out of homelessness and into housing? Um, of course, uh, we've had to change everything in the midst of COVID, like many others on this call. And so, you know, we started with social distancing and moved to masking. We've actually uh, been in as many, I think, as four motels that had a period of time right now. Um, one of our congregate facility, one of our congregate shelter facility actually transitioned to a motel. We've opened a, a new shelter site um, temporarily in an unused college dorm for men who are working and experiencing homelessness. Um, so we've done lots of things to try to offer safer shelter options, more non-congregate shelter options. And then we've really tried to accelerate our work on housing. So we had two big announcements this year in the purchase of an apartment complex and a hotel um, that we will renovate um, and turn into housing for folks who have um, disabling conditions and have gotten stuck in homelessness. So that's an overview. Um, Robert, I think I'm answering your questions. I think you asked also the greatest challenge. And I mean, we fundamentally have a problem in this city that our income and our housing market don't match, right? So we have this fundamental um, disalignment between what people earn um, and what our housing costs. And so that's really what creates this um, homelessness crisis in our community. And there's lots of ways for folks to get engaged, but uh, since we've got lots of advocates on this call, we are huge believers that housing is the solution to homelessness. So um, both the city and county have done great things in, in moving the needle on uh, permanent supportive housing and other affordable housing options and just encourage continued creativity and investment in those solutions. Liz, thank you for that response and that overview of Roof Above's work. Now we'll uh, turn it over to Deronda Metz, uh, Director of Social Services with Salvation Army Center of Hope. Well, good evening, everybody. Um, thank you. Thank you from our elected officials to the grassroots organizations that care about an issue that's been near and dear to me throughout my whole social work career. And I, I just have to start off by saying what a day. And, and, and a lot of days are, are like that. Uh, the first thing I 
do at the beginning of my work day is start thinking about shelter capacity. And that's what we do at the Salvation Army. Uh, we have pretty much been a leader in providing emergency shelter for women and children and families and have expanded from that point. Um, you know, the encampments, there were some times uh, along the way we, that we got involved in street homelessness, but we really, our role has really been to make sure that we operate a low barrier shelter, that we don't have high barriers for people to get into shelter, whether that's mental illness, whether that's substance abuse, that we open those doors and we have those services on site so people can get the support that they need. Um, another role that we do is we also do housing. So we do rapid rehousing. We have about 150 or so families in housing through rental subsidies and through a partnership with In Living In, um, our housing authority. We also serve families in 60 units. So how has COVID, what changed for us when COVID hit? Oh my goodness. So we are essential services and clearly also our shelter workers had to show up, not just at the Salvation Army, but at all shelters. And so we were there working along with public health, with Mecklenburg County, the city. We had to lower our 400 number, which we thought was a lot, in the shelter because we're a congregate facility and move people actually into hotels. So let me just say that today we have about 600 people in an emergency shelter. Shelter is still open. We're not closed temporarily on Spratt Street. We are doing a renovation. So we have those guest place in hotels. Thankfully, through a partnership with Roof Above, we are actually providing shelter at uh, their hotel location on Clanton Road. Um, one of the greatest challenges we're having, I, you know, I, I said every day I ask, what is the shelter capacity? And there are days like this past week when we have been full and maybe one or two people can get in. But our greatest challenge is outflow, is housing. So it's getting people out of now the shelter hotel situation into a housing unit. So what we're doing is that we, uh, we've we hired some additional staff to be on site at those hotels to help people navigate, but we need housing units. So if people want to know what we need, we need housing units. And of course, our families definitely need furnishing to be able to move out of homelessness. So thank you all. Taronda, thank you. Thank you for that overview and for the, the vital work you all do. Now we will go to Deborah Woolard, with, who's the founder of Block Love Charlotte, and she can share about the work that they are doing and uh, how they've responded during COVID-19. Deborah. Greetings. My name is Deborah Woolard. I'm the founder of Block Love Charlotte. Um, our organization has been serving in the uh, community, not just in Uptown, but and pretty much anywhere we can find uh, those neighbors that are without homes, we assist. We've been doing it for over three years now. We've just been concentrating and more focused in the uptown area since COVID hit. We have been out here every single day since March 8th, providing whatever we can, what that looks like, tents, tarps, sleeping bags, meals, um, toiletries, assisting those that are you know chronically ill, trying to get them into shelter, um, if we work with two on one services, if there was no beds available, we were able to provide them and set them up in hotels or motels throughout Charlotte. We help with prescriptions, groceries, pretty much where there is a need. We just try to step in and fill that need. And our goal is to um, really assist those that are affected by homelessness to gain our trust so that they will then in turn trust the resources that we are referring them to every single day because the resources are out there. It is just a matter of also getting our neighbors to earn the trust of those resources that are available. Um, next, um, what COVID-19 has presented for us is it's caused us to dig deeper to really look at the issues at hand, um, how we can help those that, for one, we have those that are out here that choose to be out here. We don't want to look over that. Um, so how can we better assist them? What is it they're they're missing or they're, they're, they need? Where is the gap in that? Um, is it because they don't trust the services? How can we get them to better trust the services so then they will use the resources that are currently in place? So those are some of the things that we have looked at while we have been out here. We also want to look at those that are affected by domestic violence. Um, what are the reasons they may or may not have been able to get into the battered women's shelter or for those that are transgender um, that we do assist out here. We want to look at those particular issues and try to figure out how we can resolve those. Um, what have been some of our obstacles and our barriers? Um, working with 
the other, uh, not resources, but organizations, um, trying to get everyone to better understand that uh, not everybody out here needs an additional tent or sleeping bag. There's more to it than just riding through uptown and seeing what people have now dubbed tent city and just thinking that it is an eyesore, is it a problem or that everybody actually just needs um, housing. There's more to the picture and just getting everybody to see that picture. I think the last part of that question is how can people help? Ask, ask the resources and the organizations that are out here every single day, like Block Love Charlotte, Heart Speaks is one, Just Do It movement, Watchmen in the Street. Ask the organizations that are already on the ground that have been on the ground to find out how you can better assist instead of just making assumptions that this is needed, that is needed, because that's not always the case. And then we look at uh, what people have continued to argue about is the trash and the buildup of donations. Well, you know what? If you don't just assume that something is needed out here and you actually ask questions, maybe we can resolve some of these immediate concerns because I won't really call them an issue to our neighbors as they're more concerned to those that ride through and consider them to be an eyesore or a problem. When we have so many things that are bigger at hand, like where are we going to place our neighbors um, going forward? What is that going to look like? So those are some of the uh, things and challenges that we are facing right now. Deborah, thank you for that that overview describing the work of Block Love. And I mean, I really appreciate you touching on, you know, all being kind of a bridge to help build trust and help people connect to, to community resources and then different ways of, of focusing energy and, and ensuring that, that um, you know, our efforts are working together. So just thank you for that. Um, we will now go to Brittany Eaton who is the Assertive Community Treatment Team Director at Monarch, and she and her team have uh, provided services directly at the encampment site, and um, she is uh, we're lucky she's here joining us on this panel. So, Brittany, uh, if you will. Yeah, hi, good evening, everyone. Um, as Robert said, my name is Brittany Eaton, and I'm the Director of Operations for Assertive Community Treatment Teams at Monarch. Um, Monarch's a nonprofit that provides a really a large variety of mental health services in Mecklenburg County, and many of those um, services that we provide provide various types of assistance in regards to homelessness. Um, you know, specific to this topic, Monarch has collaborated with Cardinal um, to offer services on site um, for individuals that are currently living in the North End encampment. Um, we have a peer support specialist slash case manager um, that's there on site one day each week to actively try to engage people in services. Um, like Deborah was referring to, you know, a lot of these individuals don't necessarily trust some of um, some of, the, of us providing services, but um, we're out there trying to actively engage people um, and get them involved in services. So if someone's interested in being linked to services, then that case manager is actually able to connect them using our new um, virtual open access program. Um, this was a program that was developed in response to the COVID-19 pandemic so that we can provide services um, via telehealth. Um, so we're able to do a comprehensive clinical assessment there at the encampment in real time using those telehealth services. Um, so they're able to meet with a therapist right then and there, um, which is really unique. So from the individual, from there, you know, the individual is able to be linked to any number of services and resources based on that assessment. Um, so that includes some of our enhanced services that offer services in the community and actually meet with people daily in the encampment. Um, so our ACT and our CST teams, um, they have been doing what they do and engaging people in services at the North End encampment as well. Um, there's a lot of different aspects of our effort to support people in these programs. Um, you know, ACT and CST address safety and basic resource needs, income, housing, therapy, substance use, medications. They really do a little bit of everything to address the person as a whole and um, all of the many needs that they have. As far as barriers, um, there's really a lot of barriers to addressing homelessness that we run across. One of the biggest ones is income. Um, a majority of the individuals that we work with have no income. Um, so that quickly becomes our priority in working with them to try to help them with that and find some source of income for them. <clears throat> there are a lot of barriers um, you know, within the social security disability process for our population. 
So we also um, often you know, help them with that process as well. Um, we run into issues with also with finding low income housing. Um, sometimes the housing just isn't available. There's not enough low income housing to meet the need that it, that exists. Um, it, and there's a lot of barriers even when we do find it. Um, you know, if somebody has a legal history or things like that, you know, those things also create a lot of barriers for getting people housed as well. Um, as far as supporting our organization and efforts to support these individuals, I think transportation is one of the biggest barriers that people have um, in regards to just being able to engage in treatment in an ongoing basis. Um, what we know is that if people do not have their basic needs met, then they can't focus on the bigger goals of becoming more independent and things like that. So if people don't have their medications, don't have food, can't keep warm, don't have shelter, then these things hold them back from being, being able to do other things. So we often struggle also to help people obtain resources. Um, funds for this typically are not available except through some limited grants and stuff that we get at times. Um, and staff often have to reach into their own pockets to purchase things like tents and jackets and things like that as well. Um, I know ACT staff have purchased several tents and jackets and things when some of our folks have had them stolen um, from them and things like that. So any help with resources like that or transportation to obtain services um, for therapy or medication management and that kind of thing, all of those types of um, support would be super helpful. Awesome. Well, Brittany, well, thank you so much. That was a great overview of Monarch. And it's it's really interesting to hear about the open access model. And you, you described so well all the barriers that people face uh, when experiencing homelessness and then also dealing with, with uh, other conditions that could be contributing factors as well, mental health, substance use. So thank you for that. Um, on the on the healthcare related theme, we will now ask Jessica Salzman, Dr. Jessica Salzman from Atrium Health to share about the work that, that she and Atrium Health is doing uh, to help people experiencing homelessness and also as it relates to the encampment. Dr. Salzman. Hi everyone. Thank you so much for having me here tonight. Um, as Robert mentioned, I am an emergency medicine physician at Atrium, Maine. And I can tell you that at Atrium, we are extremely dedicated to helping to support people who are experiencing homelessness in our community. Of course, I can speak primarily through the emergency department as this is where I have the most experience. And as you know, we care for any and all patients that come through our door, including patients that are homeless. Oftentimes patients that are suffering from homelessness, they aren't necessarily having a true emergency, but they have no other access to healthcare. So they come see us in the ER uh, and essentially become their primary care doctors in a way. We're able to assess if they have any immediate healthcare needs. And through our clinical case managers who are in the emergency department, we're also able to provide additional resources that they might utilize as an outpatient. Uh, the community, uh, the, the care managers are also able to assess if they are in need of additional resources like referrals to immediate shelter, um, to address food insecurity, and getting help with their prescription medications. And as has already been mentioned tonight, we know that a lot of patients um, that are homeless are suffering from mental illness and substance use disorder. At Atrium, in partnership with Behavioral Health, if a patient comes into our emergency department and is, a, is in need of an acute psychiatric consultation, they are able to get that that night or day whenever they come in. And through uh, our site navigators, we're also able, again, to connect them with any available community outpatient needs if they don't need to talk to somebody at that time. At Atrium Maine in the emergency department, we're also lucky enough that we have a substance use disorder counselor who's available to also assess our patients' needs from that standpoint as well, and again, connect them with our community resources. Since the COVID-19 pandemic began, Atrium Health has partnered with Mecklenburg County to provide medical services to the patients that are staying at the isolation hotel. One of our community paramedics goes out to the hotel every morning and is able to round on patients there that are higher risk for suffering from complications from COVID. And recently, our community engagement team in Atrium has really focused on the challenge of homelessness in our community, and they created a strategic document addressing how we can become even more involved with our community partners so that we're able to work together to provide the support that is needed. And from my standpoint, you know, being in the healthcare field, again, I'll say this multiple times tonight, you know, one of the biggest concerns and challenges, barriers 
um, is again that access to to healthcare. Dr. Salzman, thank you. Yeah, that's um, no, that was a really just excellent overview of the different challenges around healthcare and how oftentimes people experiencing homelessness are, for lack of other options, have to use the hospitals as the basic healthcare. So, um, thank you for sharing that. Um, and now we will go again to Stacy Lowry, Director of Community Support Services, who you heard from earlier tonight, but who will also be participating in our panel. Just want to give Stacy a quick moment. Well, hello again. Um, I'm Stacey Lowry and I'm the Director of Community Support Services. We are a human services department that's part of the Health and Human Services Agency. Um, as I shared earlier, we have four impact areas, homelessness, domestic violence, substance use, um, and services for veterans. Since Karen and myself have already shared kind of what we've done and how we kind of pivoted during the pandemic, I won't share that again. But what I will highlight is um, I believe that the most significant barrier in our community for addressing homelessness is the lack of access to an availability of permanent affordable housing for all. Thank you, Robert. Thanks, Stacy. Yeah, you know, that's, I mean, there's, that's so, so right. I mean, that's such a constant theme that we heard across all of the, the panelists who shared. I mean, this, this need for access to affordable housing, but then also these other issues that are contributing at the same time, lack of, lack of income, lack of healthcare resources, just, this really does highlight, like you shared in your presentation, the complexity of homelessness. We will now move to the Q&A time, and we received many questions by email before the event, and um, we've received some tonight as well. I believe that we are having some issues with our chat box, but everyone can email their questions to townhall at mechnc.gov. That's townhall at mechnc.gov. Again, we will do our best to get through as many questions as we can tonight. And um, and and yes, we'll just try to try to cover as much ground as possible. So now I will go to one of the first questions that had come in by email. And this one is actually for Deronda with uh, Center of Hope. Um, and, and that is, Deronda, how can we make shelter or housing more accessible and safe for transgender women of color who are living homeless or on the streets? Yeah, um, so we've, we've worked hard at it. And we um, actually, we've been serving the transgender population in our shelter for years. Uh, we went through a training and we are what, if you come to our building, you'll see where it says safe zone. Um, we, um, I, I would like to think that everybody that comes to our shelter feels safe. Um, and we try to do it at one point. I thought it was a good idea for the persons that we were serving that were transgender to send them to a hotel, just so the other guests would not um, create any challenges. And then some years later, we learned that that wasn't the best practice to segregate anybody out of the shelter. I have to say that a lot has changed over the years and our guests are pretty open and receptive to the transgender population. We serve them every day. Uh, there's always this rumor out there that the Salvation Army uh, does not serve the transgender population. But clearly, if you come to our shelter and you talk to our guests, um, we definitely serve uh, the transgender population. And our staff have been trained on sensitivity. And as I said, started, you know, uh, you'll see the signs in our building safe that says safe zone. So I'm, I'm open, so Robert, I like to say I'm open to um, other feedback if people think there are things that we can improve. Thanks. Thank you for sharing that, Deronda. And and actually, while we're talking um, about the women's shelter, you know, I wanted to hear from you, too, and then I'll go to Liz after this. But, you know, I think there were questions. You touched on this some in your intro, questions around um, capacity, even, even I think some reports of shelters closing during the pandemic. Um, and also some questions about just trauma-informed care, which you started to touch on as well. But just wanted to kind of give you a second to share if there are any other things about um, things people should know about shelter, shelter access, trauma-informed care, that sort of thing. Yeah. So, you know, shelter has been, uh, even before the pandemic, I mean, we had a shelter issue, a capacity issue in our community uh, with shelter. You know, for years, um, the strategy was not to build more shelters. And so that's not something that our community, like other communities across this country, wanted to do. We really wanted to end homelessness through housing. So now we sort of have this affordable housing crisis that's sort of forcing us to relook at, at this issue. 
Uh, maybe we don't have enough shelter beds. You heard me say that we started out doing a pandemic at 400 people. That was overcrowded. And now we're at 600. So I ponder and I wonder sometimes, do we continue to build capacity or do we work on that back end to get people out, to find those units? So we have resources now to get people out of the shelter into housing, just need to find those units. And let me just say, I don't want to make it sound like that we're not moving people because we are still moving people. We just need to move more because we're serving more. Uh, we're not closed. We're doing a renovation. Our goal is um, once the uh, winter shelter that we're using for Roof Above closes on March 30th, is that we'll also be transitioning back in the Center of Hope. But clearly, we can't come back in the building with uh, 400 people. The other thing that the pandemic taught us, which I know this, I, I, you know, my staff, most of us are clinicians, fully aware that we serve a population of people that have behavioral health challenges. And it is, it can be trauma, traumatic for a family coming to live in a congregate facility. So as we look toward the future, we're looking at, even before the pandemic, we was planning on expanding, building a family shelter. Well, one of the things that we know, and we know for sure is that Families need their own room, and we don't need to have large congregate rooms like we have now with about 40 people. But that's what we were working with, um, you know, very, very well aware of the families, the trauma, and, and sheltering can be traumatic. That's why, Robert, I'm just going to say this one thing. You know, our goal is rapid rehousing. is getting people out of that shelter system as quickly as possible. Research shows that families and, and being in shelters uh, can really have some long-term, um, not so good uh, outcomes. So thank you. Thank you, Deronda. Now, uh, this question is, is for Liz uh, with Roof Above. Uh, Liz, we've, we've heard that there is space at Roof Above, that there's shelter capacity there. And, and yet at the same time, there are people at the Northern Encampment who may not go to shelter, who may may uh, decide not to go to shelter. So just wanted to, to ask you to speak to that. And then also, if you would share about just any any safety precautions, I think you touched on some of this during your, your opening, but just, um, you know, share any about the, the safety precautions for what the shelter is doing uh, in the COVID-19 environment. Robert, you will layer a question. Okay, I think that's three questions in one. So if I miss a point, let me know. Um, so Rufa does have shelter capacity. I have done this job for a while and really never been able to utter that sentence <laughs> before this pandemic, but because of kind of the incredible infusion of government support for shelter and different types of shelter, we've been able to expand. And so we have, even though we're not operating room in the inn, which, which typically is a community-based shelter program we run in the winter, even without operating that, we have a, about 100 more shelter beds than we had last winter. And so um, we have empty beds every night, um, which is a great thing because it means people can walk in during the day. Uh, we used to have a whole lottery process to get a bed at the shelter. Now it's a much more accessible process. And so I think our team has really enjoyed um, getting to do the work without uh, with the shelter being more accessible for people. Um, I think you ask around safety precautions. So we have at this point four different shelter models, um, which have different um, safety protocol based on the space itself. So, uh, but we're doing kind of two non, more or less non congregate shelters, one at a motel and one at a dorm uh, where uh, people have much more individualized space. Um, our shelter at Tryon has sleeping pods. And so people have individualized space there, though it's bunk mates. So there's bunk beds. And then we have an overflow winter shelter, which we've added sleeping barriers to, to add to some safety there. Um, it is indoor space. We require masking and we work on social distancing and our meals are to go and all of those things. But, um, you know, there's, there's realities of risk around COVID right now. And so you ask about why people might not come into shelter. And those those reasons vary, um, but I want to say that you know that has always been the case. There have always been people who don't want to access shelter, and and we need to understand that and develop a system, which we have a system that can still serve people even if they're not accessing shelter. And so reasons might vary. So sometimes it's um, mental health challenges or trauma challenges. Um, you know, our largest shelter is is nearly 260 beds. And uh, so that's a lot of people in a, in, in a space. And so for some people, that's just a really challenging environment to manage. 
Um, for some people, they might be in a cycle of addiction <clears throat> and struggling with the disease in a way that um, their life is really organized around that cycle of addiction. And, and so, um, you know, there's not necessarily interest in accessing shelter. Um, I think there's a reality of COVID risk right now, um, you know, coming indoor to shelter and being in a congregate setting uh, could be more risk. Um, and then I think there's um, there's community that forms um, with people who are unsheltered, and I think that's a reality that we need to address. And so I just think it's really critical that we develop a system, which I, I believe we have, but we can always improve, where no matter where someone is homeless, we're working on paths paths out of homelessness, right? Wherever you end up on the spectrum, we're going to find a way out of that homelessness uh, with you. That's the dream. That doesn't always happen, right? But that's what we're working towards. Yeah. So thanks for sharing that, Liz. You really covered all three questions, the layered questions that I had there. So thank you for, for you know, covering so much ground. Um, as we shared earlier, people can email questions at townhall at mecnc.gov, and we're trying to get through as many as we can. I will be, for the next question, I'll make sure it's just one question, and this is um, to Deborah with Block Love. And, and a question that came in is how, what, what would be the best way for someone to get involved at the encampment? And Deborah, I know you started touching on this during your, your introduction to the organization, but would love to hear you build more on that. Um, so yes, one of the best ways to get involved is to ask, and I know um, when I said that earlier, someone may say, well, I'm not quite sure who these organizations are or how to get in touch with these organizations. But there's been a lot on social media. There's been a lot um, in news media. Um, so it's really easy to just kind of Google to look at these organizations. I threw out just four that I know off the top of my head. Um, but just to ask them what's needed, because they're out here, like I said, just about every day, um, maybe not specifically in the uptown area, but I do know like Watchmen in the Streets goes into the camps. Um, just do it. Movement concentrates, you know, in the Sugar Creek area. Um, we're pretty much in several areas, not in just an uptown, like we're able to take care of the North Lake, Nevins, Sunset area, uh, W.T. Harris. Um, uh, then you have Hearts Beat as one, but there's several organizations and it just sometimes takes that moment to just say, let me ask how I can help versus making the assumption. Because for an example, for the holidays, there were so many organizations that came out with tents and sleeping bags. Um, then it became a competition of who has the bigger tent versus who has a smaller tent. Then it became the, oh, well, I got those three tents there are for my storage. And then that one's for, um, you know, when I sleep in. Then when people drive through, they say, oh, it's more people out here than it really is because they're counting the tents versus counting the people. Or um, when you get in that argument, of, I have a bigger tent, you got the smaller tent, then tents get start getting set on fire. Um, we, we as an organization don't give out anything that is flammable. Like I don't give out matches, lighters, lighter fluid, grills, any of that type of stuff. Cause I have to take that into consideration too and how much time and effort our fire department puts into um, going in and distinguishing these fires. But those are things that you have to examine and look at or someone will say, well, there's so much food out here. I had actually had a conversation this evening um, because while I've been on here, I've also been serving on the block. And I had a conversation with a man that said, you know what? I pulled up with pizzas the other day and the people would tell me they were tired of pizzas. Well, guess what? If it's eight groups coming out here and four of those groups have pizza, then yes, they're getting tired of eating pizzas. And that's kind of what happens. And I know it's not always easy to coordinate the meals or coordinate who's coming out, but it is easy sometimes to just stop and ask, how can I assist? Um, what's actually needed at this moment in time? And don't get discouraged if organizations right now are telling you they cannot use the clothing. Like we cannot use the clothing. Clothing, like this morning when I drove, the clothing is just dropped off and it's left there. Like I had to do a mad dash on this morning because I had to be somewhere else. But, you know, my neighbors, my buddies, my block family, they're telling me, ma'am, sis, Deb, stop with the clothing light and i tell them you guys i'm doing the best that i can to let people know stop dropping off your clothing and just leaving it there because then it becomes a, a once again that whole eyesore but it's an eyesore that wasn't there before when no one else was out but our organization and urban ministries you know when no one else was out we didn't have that issue because we were limited on what we had um but now it's just become to a point where it's being heaped out there and there's nowhere for these different donations and stuff to go. 
it, so it's kind of like more and more keeps coming. It just contributes, contributes to not always having the type of impact that, that could be most helpful for people and, and creating even potentially more dangers or more risks or complications as a result of that. So as you said both times when you spoke, the importance of just asking to really understand what, what people's needs are, what really helps them best help. Thank you. So now we've got, oh, and actually one question that came through that I wanted to clarify is, is someone asked about the term North End Encampment, and that is, if that's referring to the same thing as the Tent City, and, and I, I did want to be clear that, um, yes, that is, that's, we had, you know, started to refer to that, just the the encampment as the North End Encampment, um, it's what most people have referred to as the Tent City, but just wanted to be clear that we are uh, referring to the same thing. Um, going on to the next question, we're going to talk about behavioral health care, mental health substance use access, and going to go to Brittany with, with Monarch. Um, and so in her work leading the, the assertive community treatment team for mental health services, um, they really do a lot of frontline work providing providing mental health services for people who are most in need. And I know Brittany and her team have been on site. And, and Brittany, I wanted to hear from you about um, what what you would say are maybe some misconceptions people may have around mental health issues and, and maybe even if there are misconceptions that people may have in your experience working at the North End Encampment around those issues. So I'll, I'll go to Brittany now. Yeah, so I think, um, you know, for the most part, a lot of people are aware that, you know, the majority of the homeless population also struggle with mental illness and or substance use um, issues. I think that's pretty common knowledge at this point, or I hope it is anyway. Um, so, you know, one thing that I would say is that, you know, when we're out there um, providing services and addressing mental health symptoms and things like that, well, that's a big part of what we do. We also do a lot of case management. So, you know, helping people access needed resources for food, for clothes, for medication, um, helping them to obtain some form of income. And then, of course, ultimately trying to help them with that housing piece um, in various ways as well. So you know, I think that's a big misconception is that we're just addressing the mental health symptoms and mental health treatment, you know, in, in, in its current state has become so much more than that. Um, it's it's a whole lot of addressing the person as a whole and helping them with a lot of other things. I think um, another common misconception is that these individuals could become more independent if they just weren't lazy or made better choices. Um, you know, I just want to point out that most of the population, um, for example, that we work with on ACT, many of which are homeless, um, have a diagnosis of schizophrenia or some related disorder um, along those lines. Um, schizophrenia is the third most disabling condition for adults in the world, um, right behind quadriplegia and Alzheimer's dementia. So it, this is a really complex condition that um, you know has a lot of components to it that are really disabling and limit the function um, for these individuals. So we're talking about very big, very real impairments that impact their ability to function day to day, doing all the things that they need to be able to live independently. Um, you know, other uh, mental illnesses also present very real challenges for people um, to try to overcome. And many of these individuals have no natural supports to help them. They don't have um, a lot of family or friends, you know, either they've burned bridges or, you know, lots of different things, <laughs> life, life happens, right? Um, but a lot of them don't have a lot of support. So they're often trying to, you know, battle these things and deal with these things alone. Um, so it's not just laziness. It's not just bad choices that create a situation where someone is homeless. It's impairments in functioning that are caused by real illnesses um, that are just as real as diabetes or high blood pressure or cancer. Um, and I think a lot, a, a lot of times um, people tend to forget that a little bit. Um, you know, and that's not to mention all the other barriers that these individuals face. If someone's mental illness is spiraling out of control, um, they likely haven't been able to work in a very long time, which means no income. No income means no medication to help their symptoms, um, you know, no food except what's given to them by others, no ways to get clothes or shelter, no transportation, 
no way to get a job because their symptoms were out of control. So it just creates this big cycle um, that they get kind of stuck in. And so, you know, it's, it's very real. Um, and there's a lot of barriers that exist within the Social Security disability system that keep many people from being able to access that resource without a lot of help and a lot of support. Um, so, you know, we try to intervene there to try to break the cycle um, in different ways. Um, if we can get that person some medication to help control their symptoms, then they're better, better able to function. Um, you know, while we're getting them stabilized on meds, we can help them access and find resources to meet those basic needs, food, shelter, clothes. Um, and then from there, we can help them to get a job or get some form of income with um, the disability process so that we can then then work with them on housing. You know, so we have to work on all these different pieces, um, you know, sometimes one at a time, sometimes all at the same time. But there's all these pieces we have to address in order to get to the ultimate goal of them having independent housing in the community. So it's really a long and challenging process, um, you know, in helping these individuals. But ultimately, it's a very rewarding one. Brittany, what stands out to me from your response is just the intersectionality, the intersection, intersection of all these issues at once. I mean, income, uh, serious, uh, whether it's mental health or behavioral health needs, health care, and how these things compound and, and contribute to uh, difficult situations a person might be in. I think you did a great job describing the importance of not stigmatizing people who are, are dealing with different challenging experiences, whatever those may be. Um, We'll go from here to Dr. Salzman, and uh, Dr. Salzman just wanted to hear about, from, from your experience, what the major health needs are of, of people at the encampment, um, and, and just hear your perspective on that. Sure, and I can say, you know, that probably expands to all folks that are struggling with homelessness in one way or another, but, you know, as I already mentioned before, I think the biggest challenge is going to be access to care. So, um, a lot of the community clinics and all clinics in general require appointments and that in itself is a huge barrier for a lot of people um, you know they might not have transportation they might not have a working phone and of course that is going to be a problem when you're trying to get to a doctor's appointment um, in any way um, you know especially with covid a lot of healthcare services are also transition to um, virtual and require a decent amount of technology as well. So that's going to be another barrier for them to access those services. And of course, I think about all these people that have chronic health care issues. You know, you mentioned schizophrenia, of course, uh, mental illness, substance use disorder, but also other diagnoses like high blood pressure, diabetes. Uh, and again, while they're not being able to access health care, they might not have their medications they might not be you know eating as healthy as they can of course and i worry about that in regards to their chronic diseases and that that can only accelerate the progression for those patients and those people yeah that's no that's right i mean this that that would just it just add to the to the struggle and the, and the progression of, of of any any health issue or deterioration um, got a question now. Going to go to Stacy Lowry uh, with with CSS, and um, this is a question that has come in through email, and it's a question about um, what is considered extreme weather, and how many more beds bed areas open up, and who decides when extreme weather is is declared. So, yeah, sure, no problem. Again, a layered question, right? <laughs> I know that's. <laughs> Um, as far as extreme weather, um, when there is going to be extreme weather, the county is monitoring it with the different agencies, as well as the Charlotte Mecklenburg Emergency Management Office. And actually, um, when we call extreme weather and need to open up additional sheltering options, that is made in collaboration with Charlotte Mecklenburg Emergency Management Office and Mecklenburg County government. So it's joint city county. Um, and as I said, usually with weather, we kind of know it's coming. So we've already continued to monitor and hear from our partners, our shelter partners, as far as capacity. Um, and at that time, if we feel as though there's going to be severe inclement weather coming, snow, ice, um, severe drops in temperature, um, we have the ability to, uh, to provide um, over 100 additional beds in addition to what's currently out there. And we have the flexibility to pivot and add more if needed. 
Thank you, Stacey. Yeah, so a readiness to 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 add on to to resources as needed as weather weather demands really. Um, so going from here, uh, this question, Liz, this question is for you, and it's it's a question about data, and I think this comes up often. But you know, we've heard numbers tonight. We heard eighty four individuals at the encampment or the tent city right now. And uh, this comes from a, a person who is part of a group that serves people in that area and and are saying that they are seeing more than 84 individuals there. I, I wanted to hear from you, Liz, on how uh, you, uh, your team, the outreach team collects data through street outreach. And, and, and to, for the data that we have uh, regarding the tents. Yeah, well, I think about when we when we report on the point in time count data and at the number, I forget what it was, but I think it was around the 180 people who are unsheltered uh, that we found that last year's point in time count. And sometimes we say at least like right at minimum, like because these are the people we know about and we know like part of homelessness is you never capture everyone. Right. So you try to have good systems and do your best. But, but you know, um, so sometimes people um, intentionally hide in homelessness and sometimes it's hard to capture everyone. And so it's not just a roof above effort. So there's a team effort and, and Karen spoke earlier about the different partners who are engaged with that. And so there's an effort to go out and meet with people and connect. And so um, so I know kind of like our outreach estimates have been, you know, probably somewhere between 90 and 130 people in the encampment, but there are I think the latest number is 84 active people that we know of, that we've worked with, that we've connected with. And so um, we also know that it's fluid, right? And so again, it's kind of how do you capture this number? So there might be someone who's in the encampment during the day, but at 10 p.m. at night goes to our Statesville Avenue shelter and sleeps and then comes back. And so I'll just, sorry, I'll, I'll just go on a little tangent and say, um, in the 1980s, so homelessness is fairly new, so it really came on the scene in the 70s and 80s. And when you read the early research, there was like this back and forth, these vicious debates about how many people were homeless, right? And we spent all of these minds just trying to come up with a number instead of asking, what in the world do we do about the fact that there are people who are homeless? And so, you know, I think it is important to understand kind of range of numbers of who's in the encampment, what are the issues we're facing, but we don't want to be focused on how many people are there. We want to be focused on how are we getting people out and how are we serving people better. Thanks for that, Liz. Yeah, that, that solution focused element instead of the, you know, the, the yes, the, the the fluid number. Um, so, Toronto, I'll go to you on this, and this is a layered question, but it's only two questions. We have a lot of great questions from the audience right now. This is really just uh, there's there's so much to cover. So it's, it's just great to see this engagement. Uh, Deronda, what are the biggest challenges uh, families in housing crisis are facing with school age children and what's being done? What needs to be done? So when um, the pandemic hit, I mean, we started advocacy initially my first thought was we had a uh, 100 plus kids cms kids in the hotels so reached out to cms to mckinney thinking that it was already planned but it wasn't and so but had a good uh, work strategically with cms with uh, the steve smith foundation um uh, urban league they contributed and we early on found a site a virtual site for our children that were in the hotel and at that time Got the funding, CMS was actually sending buses to those hotels, taking those kids to the virtual site. So we are, yeah, we, we are working with CMS. We have a liaison uh, that's assigned to our kids. And so that's going as well as to be expected. You know, I wish I could say that all of our kids are somewhere now, you know, doing homework, et cetera. But there, there are certain challenges that our children uh, face. Um, when they're in a homeless crisis, sometimes, unfortunately, they take on the crisis as their parents take on, right? They're in that survival mode and trying to make sure that they have a place to stay and eat. But I think we're doing pretty well with, with uh, the partnerships. Partnership with CMS, and then you're really highlighting it's it's a it's a traumatic event for an entire family, not just not just parents, not just kids. It's, it's really everyone is so affected by this. Uh, Brittany, this question is for you. This came in through the uh, the email. This is um, regarding the virtual open access program. 
And so it's it's saying is that interoperable across agencies, homeless organizations, supportive services, and helping everyone to see or manage cases, or is it primarily for initial health assessment and then referrals to other services or, or organizations? And let me know if I need to repeat that, or really anytime I need to repeat a question, just let me know. So yeah, no problem. Um, so our, you know, Monarch's kind of been known for our open access model for a while now. Um, and open access traditionally, pre-COVID, um, you know, was a model that we utilized in our outpatient clinics um, where individuals could walk in um, without an appointment and they would be seen um, for that initial assessment. Um, so they would have intake done, you know, initial screenings and assessment completed. And from there, you know, um, they would also be able to potentially see if needed and referred for um, medication. They would be able to see the doctor that day as well and, and you know, get the medication management piece if, if that was um, an emergent need for that person. Um, so they were able to triage people through these assessments as well. Um, you know, and so if somebody was really high risk, high need um, and they needed help that day, we were able to do it, um, which was awesome. Um, obviously, COVID put a little bit of a damper on on that. Um, and so uh, through a lot of um, work and development, we came up with the um, virtual open access model. Um, and the virtual open access model is pretty much exactly like that original open access model. But um, we have utilized telehealth. So now instead of being limited to how many people that one therapist or that to those you know, couple of therapists in that outpatient office or that one doctor in that outpatient office can see in a day. Um, we actually have access to link individuals to any of our therapists across all of our locations in the state um, and any of our doctors across all the locations in the state. So it really has truly opened up access um, in, in a tremendous way. And we're super excited about it. It's been working really well. Um, but to kind of get back to that that question there, um, the purpose of the virtual open access model is truly to get that initial assessment completed, triage, and see what's needed right then, um, and connect people to those um, immediate needs in terms of resources, but also help them, you know, connect to longer term services and resources as well. Um, you know, they can still do the medication management that day if that's something that's truly needed and um, things like that. So it's really about what, you know, assessing what help is needed and then from there making referrals out and, and you know, handling things and getting people that those needed resources and assistance. So it's really both and you're doing the short, meeting the short term needs often and then helping connect people to longer term resources. That's that's great. And the medication management the same day. That's that's so important. So, Deborah, this question, this is this is for Deborah with with Block Love. And oh, this is a really great question. Uh, so if there was a group, maybe 10 to 20 people who wanted to help with the encamp encampment, who should they contact? If you're wanting to help in the encampment, um, one of the things I would first of all ask, like, what type of help is needed? Because um, I don't want anyone to just assume that you come down and you volunteer. What are you volunteering to do? Like you're coming into these people's what I consider their turf, their area, their domicile, their block. Um, like when we serve, we're serving in their area. Um, I actually had to ask them after serving for a while. I said, you know. I need to ask you all permission to even come and serve and then find out what is it that you all actually need. Um, so if it's a group of individuals, you know, if someone came down, if you don't connect with an organization, let's say one person comes down and assess maybe what's needed, check in with Urban Ministries group above. Um, now that we're on here, check in with Block Love, not to say that we are the um, end all to be all, but what I am saying is we have been literally boots on the ground since March 8th, so we can give you a better understanding of how you can get involved. Because um, a lot of times it's not just a matter of volunteering, as much as it is a matter of trying to find out what gap needs to be filled in and how you can help us fill in those gaps, if you're willing to. Um, I've seen so many people out here gung-ho, there is no competition in giving, nobody's trying to be bitter, bigger, better, or greater than the next. But if we can connect and just say, hey, all of the organizations that are out there on social media, 
send them a message. You know, we, we message and text, tweet and everything else all day long. Send an organization a message and say, how can I best get involved? Because it may not need 10 of you all. We may need five of you all to come and help sort one day. We may, may need three of you all to come through and help us get um, bug spray and everything around the tents and the, and the different things. There may be a need for 20 to help with cleanup. You know, every day looks different when we're out here. Um, but yes, definitely, I keep reiterating this, ask. You know, it's just really important to ask what's the best way to get involved instead of just assuming that, you know, um, if 10 of you all show up, we got somewhere to put you all um, out here. Because a lot of times when there is more individuals out there, then it becomes chaos. There's nowhere to park. There's um, so many people out there that, you know, quite honestly, we miss the needs because everybody's around talking because they feel like there's nothing to do or um, it, it just becomes then like a free for all. Um, and that's what we don't want because we're still in their area. Like, you know, even when we're bringing the noise, keep the noise down. I love to have the music out there while I'm serving, but I don't do it at the tents. My music, I, I keep on the block on Pfeiffer. I don't do it at the tents because guess what? Somebody's in there sleeping. How dare I roll up at their house and have my music turned up? So we got to be respectful and be mindful of those that we serve every day. I appreciate you sharing that. And and again, so it's going back in, to asking and to making sure it's coordinated, that 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 it's the needs are met and the respect that you're talking about with all of this. Um, Deborah, and I think we'll have this shared later in the night with uh, links and contact information for everybody. But if someone was want, wanted to connect with Block Love, who would they reach out to? The best way to get in contact with Block Love, um, and once again, we are a small organization, <laughs> but the best way to get in contact with us is through email um, which is team, T-E-A-M, at blocklovesclt.org. That email address is also on our website. There's also a contact us form. Our website is blocklovesclt.org, but email is always best. I constantly have my phone on me, and while I'm out here in the streets, I can respond back quicker than I can via phone. Well, you heard it, everybody listening. There are ways to contact even, <laughs> even directly. So, um, so yeah, and I, and I know know you're out there working tirelessly. So, um, going on to the next question, and I am just pulling this up right now. We have so many great questions coming in, and and I know we're getting closer. We're getting close to the half hour that's that's left for the rest of the night. Um, but got a question for Stacy, and Stacy, this is a question um, just about the. Who pays for the cost for current housing that the county provides currently? And I, and I know there's a, there are a lot of different layers and partnerships that are involved with that. So uh, if you would speak to that about county funding for housing. Yeah, not a problem. Um, the housing that the county does provide is actually funded through a number of different um, sources that would include both the federal government, state government, and then local county funding. Um, community support services is only one department and we do provide some housing services um, and we do it ourselves as well as with our nonprofit partners. Um, you can learn more about the different programs that we have um, by going to the community support services website. Um, it will give you more details. And I believe that they're going to drop that into the chat. Um, and I think another important piece that we've been talking about tonight is this, we're not talking about housing only. We're talking about housing with services for the individuals that need that. And supportive services is another piece that the county does um, contribute local funding to, to agencies to ensure that people can not only access housing, but they can also maintain their housing. Thank you, Robert. Thanks, Stacey. Yeah, that supportive services piece is so essential. And, and really hearing everyone share tonight, I mean, it does, it does just highlight how interconnected all of these services are and really these teams, everyone serving people experiencing homelessness working together on this issue. So, um, Dr. Salzman, I'll go to you with our next question. And that is, what would be the ways or how would a person experiencing homelessness access health care resources if they were in need? Sure. So there are a lot of community clinics that see patients and um, they work with patients as far as getting them on the sliding scale, um, working them, working with them to connect to social workers and clinical case managers. They can also help them apply for different types of insurance, um, depending on their qualifications and things like that. Um, that's certainly one way. Again, 
a lot of barriers to that for some of these folks, especially at the encampment um, that I already spoke to, uh, things like transportation, um, even having phone service, things like that. Um, again, you know, I don't want to encourage necessarily people coming to the emergency department, but if that's the only way that they have access to care, then then we're we're open all the time and we see everybody again, no matter you know who you are or what you have. Um, and again, we're able to initially assess people in the emergency department for any, not only an acute issue, but while they're there, you know, again, our clinical case managers are able to connect them even better with some of these outpatient resources. You know, if they're living in the encampment, they and don't don't really interact with some of the shelter services, then they might not necessarily know that some of these community clinics exist. Um, so when they come to, to um, the emergency department, then we're able to talk to them about those services. Um, Again, at Atria Maine, we're very lucky. We have um, a fast track scheduler. So um, if the patient does have, a, a, they have to have a working phone or know somebody that has a working phone so that we're able to get in touch with them. And we're actually able to plug them into some of those community clinics. And it's not only for primary care, if they are in need um, of a specialist in certain instances like gastroenterology or urology, uh, in, in certain instances, we're able to connect them with those physicians as well and those appointments. Yeah, so kind of going back to what Stacy was just sharing about the wraparound supportive services, even, even if not called that formally, there's still that element of just that, that really wraparound care and connection to other care and other other clinics and resources in the community. So got time for just a few more questions and we have so many great ones. Uh, this, this really just highlights how this conversation needs to continue and, and will. I know this conversation actually continues all the time uh, with most of the providers on, on this call in different ways. This is going back to Liz and Deronda and this is regarding the shelters. Are there certain criminal charges that would prohibit prohibit a person from being accepted into the shelter? If that is the case, are there other shelter options? So, okay, we serve women and children and families. We serve men also too with children attached to a family. Right now, we're serving even couples. We cannot serve sex offenders, and that is the, the only one. And to be honest, I really don't know what the options are, uh, but that that is um, pretty much the only limitation that we, we would have for someone not being able to come to the shelter for obvious reasons. And let's... Yeah, so at Roof Above, um, we are not able to serve sex offenders at all locations, but we are able to serve sex offenders at some locations, uh, just depending on uh, kind of the regulations around what are what are the buildings surrounding a shelter. So, for example, at our winter overflow shelter at Statesville, um, zero questions there. We can serve people there. At our Tryon shelter, uh, we do... Uh, as case by case basis, we review what the charge is and, and look into that. So, um, but otherwise, we don't look at any other criminal background. We are, we don't love to take people being released directly from prison because we don't believe we're a discharge plan. So, if someone comes to us directly from prison, we're going to uh, make a phone call and have a conversation about kind of what was someone's discharge plan. Um, and we, uh, because we are a group setting, um, if people are violent while in shelter, um, often we will ask, we will not be able to serve people if they've um, been violent in, within the shelter. So that's not about criminal background. That's about once people are with us. But, but so there are times that we are not able to serve people. But one of the exciting things about having this very low barrier winter overflow shelter is we've been able um, to serve people who might not be welcome at another location. Um, because it, it's acting just as an overnight shelter. And so that low barrier shelter as part of the winter, that, that helps provide kind of a gap in a sense in, in community shelter access. For, yeah. yeah, I think it's one of those things, right? Like, what are we learning in the pandemic? Like, certainly one thing we're learning is motels can be really power, a really powerful tool in ending homelessness. But what are the things we're doing now? that we want to continue once every once we're through this what do we want to take from what we're learning and keep applying and for us i think the winter overflow shelter is something that we would love to consider continuing 
Absolutely. Yeah. And that, that really highlights it. I mean, can we move from this crisis and create lasting changes that really help help everybody in our community? I uh, did want to say there there are uh, quite a few more elected officials uh, joined us uh, tonight, including the mayor. So just wanted to thank thank her for joining us. Thank uh, many of the other elected officials who are here with us tonight, and and we appreciate you all tuning in. We really appreciate everybody tuning in. Um, the questions have been so thoughtful and and important, and and this conversation has just been been great. I will have one more question, um, and I, I will I will send this over to Stacy with Community Support Services, and that is. Stacey, if there was one misconception that people have about homelessness, what would that be? And, and what would you want to, what would be the myth busting uh, piece of that? Yes, thank you. Um, I think a common misperception, especially in response to the pandemic and the increased visibility of homelessness in the community is that it wasn't a problem before COVID-19, um, that it just started, um, but that's simply not true. Homelessness and housing instability have predated the pandemic, and they've only worsened since. Um, my department, Community Support Services, has been committed to this work before the pandemic, and will continue to work with our partners across all the systems to end and prevent homelessness um, until the goal is met where everyone has a place to call home. That says it very well. So, yes. Um, so let's see. I think we are now at the point where we will transition over to. Let's see. We're going now to the um, the next. I'm making sure we don't have any poll question right here. Nope. We are going to uh, Deputy County Manager Anthony Trotman, um, who will be sharing on ways each of us can help to address housing instability and homelessness in our community. And uh, again, I just want to thank the panelists for joining us tonight. They did an excellent job. I mean, having dialogue. We had so many significant questions that came through um, through email, through the chat at the beginning when it was working smoothly. And uh, I want to thank everyone too for the flexibility on some of the the technical issues we had on the front end. And so. Now I will turn it over to Anthony um, for him to share different ways that, that people can get involved. All right, thank you, Robert. And everyone listening can play a critical role in supporting organizations in our community that work to address housing instability and homelessness. We acknowledge all of the support that is being provided at the encampment by many of you watching tonight. We are, we are now asking that you join in solutions that help provide greater opportunities and more lasting solutions for the people at the encampment. As previously stated, the encampment is not on county property, but is on a combination of private property, including Morningstar, Roof Above, and Verizon, as well as city and state property. Property owners, if they so choose, have a right to request enforcement of second degree trespassing statutes to remove the encampment or any other trespasser on their property. We are discouraging the dropping off of firewood, closing and meals that are often going to waste. By continuing to bring items to the encampment, we unintentionally promote its growth and create potential health or safety hazards such as fires or contaminated food. Instead, we encourage different ways to get involved. This can take many forms, including giving time or donating goods and resources to homeless and crisis agencies. The most important thing is that we as a community streamline our efforts to have the greatest impact. In order to accomplish this, we're asking the community to drop off items such as clothing, food, and household goods, or volunteer with specific agencies that are serving the encampment. And as you've heard from our panelists, there are multiple ways that you can help make a difference. If you want to help people at the encampment, volunteer with Black Love Charlotte to connect people to resources, as was pre previously stated. If you're interested in giving financially, please donate to the agencies who participated on our panel tonight or other agencies who support people experiencing homelessness. 
If you're interested in serving meals to people experiencing homelessness, please contact Salvation Army. If you'd like to donate canned goods or non-perishable items, please do so at Loaves and Fishes. If you'd like to donate clothing or, or household items, please do so at one of Goodwill's various locations. If you're an employer, connect with Roof Above or Salvation Army's employment specialists and help people experiencing homelessness obtain jobs. If you are a landlord, enroll with Social Service Housing CLT program to rent to someone who has a housing subsidy through a community agency. You can make a difference, especially if you're willing to rent to people who have credit, legal, or eviction histories. Contact information and websites for each of these agencies are listed on this screen and will be posted on the county's website. If you're interested in advocacy, engage with our community's continuum of care, the governing body that makes decisions on how our community allocates funding for our HUD priorities. If you'd like to support our annual point in time count, please email pit at mecnc.gov to learn more. We have compiled this information along with the different ways to get involved, which you can access via the link in the chat box. You can also go to mecnc.gov for more information. Thank you for your time and support. And seeing the numbers of attendees we have here tonight gives me hope that our community will do the work that needs to be done. Robert, I'll turn it back over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Anthony. Yeah, that, that was a great uh, summation of, of a lot of different ways for people to get involved. And I, I hope that everyone will hear the importance of there are all these agencies doing so much great work in the community and, and an opportunity to, to focus our efforts to, to, to have the greatest impact possible. And so now, We'll go to the audience uh, poll question number three, which should be displaying on the screen. And that question is just really following up on what's been shared by our panel and then what was shared by Anthony just now. And that is, what are you committed to doing next to support the work to address homelessness in Mecklenburg County? What are you committed to doing next to support the work to address homelessness in Mecklenburg County? And as options, we've got volunteer with Block Love Charlotte, donate financially to a homeless services agency, serve meals through Salvation Army, donate food or canned goods to loaves and fishes, donate clothing to Goodwill, offer employment through Roof Above or Salvation Army, rent an affordable unit with Social Serve, or all of the above. And so, just give it a minute and let some responses come in. And just again, want to thank you all for coming out tonight as, as we're heading into the to the a home stretch of the event this evening. Just give it a little more time for responses to come in. And yeah, I'm just thinking about how so much of what everyone shared really speaks to the fact that this is a community effort. There are all these agencies working hand in hand together really on the front lines serving people in our community and and just seeing the number of questions and engagement from the audience it makes me really hopeful we can continue this conversation and continue to find these different ways of engaging so looking through there's um there are all these different great ways of people outlining how they're going to get involved and it's a pretty pretty well divided list too a lot of people gave responses um and it, even some people who are going to be donating or listing an affordable unit through social serve. I see a couple of people responding with employment opportunities through roof above or Salvation Army. Also see people volunteering with block love, lots of interest there and in donating resources and uh, and connecting with the emergency shelters as well. So. So, yeah, so now, um, thank you all and. For the last uh, 15 minutes or so, uh, we will start to now turn it over to our county manager Diorio and Chairman Dunlap for any closing thoughts or reflections they have uh, for tonight's event. So, uh, county manager. 
Thank you, Robert. And and what can I say? What an amazing town hall. Um, I mean, you can see that there are many ways that you can plug in and try to help this community um, to try to facilitate and help um, our homeless neighbors. So I really want to appreciate um, everybody who is here. But I do want to take a moment to um, thank the Board of County Commissioners. Um, you may or may not know we had several board members on on the meeting tonight. We had Commissioner Lee Altman, Commissioner Pat Cotham, Commissioner Laura Meyer, Commissioner Elaine Powell. Commissioner Mark Durrell and Commissioner Susan Rodriguez McDowell, in addition to our chairman. And that is an indication of how committed the Board of County Commissioners is to this issue and how they are going to do everything they can to try to be uh, to try to uh, bring forward solutions uh, to this problem. So I want to thank them for their participation. I also want to thank Liz and Deronda and Brittany and Deborah and Jessica and Stacy and Karen, because they are the true heroes. These are the folks that live every single day trying to work to solve this problem and trying to bring forward solutions to help our community. So um, I am I am amazed and always enthralled with how, with the great work that our people do. And I cannot be more proud um, to be the county manager for a county that has such committed people who are working on this issue every single day. And I would be remiss if I did not thank our incredible MC, uh, Robert Nesbitt. I, I chatted to Anthony that this man has a career in so show business. He can be the next Phil Donahue being able to moderate a talk show. I am incredibly proud to have him as part of my team. Um, but I just, and the fact that we had over 300 people on this town hall tonight is an indication of how many people care about this issue and want to help. And so, as Anthony said, it gives me hope uh, to be part of this and to see so many people who are committed to this. And so with that, I will uh, turn it over to my esteemed chairman, uh, Commissioner George Dunlap to provide the final words. Well, thank you, Dina. Um, I'm really speechless. Um, it gives me hope um, to know that so many people care and are concerned about the citizens of our community. I too want to start by thanking our amazing staff. Um, every day, I tell people across this country how proud I am to be a part of Mecklenburg County. And I think each one of my fellow commissioners would agree with that. We, we have some amazing staff. So I want to start by thanking you. I also want to thank all of our elected officials that were on the call. Uh, I noticed that there were state officials, there were city council persons, um, thank you so much, because this, this issue goes beyond the boundaries of Mecklenburg County. Um, and so I can't thank you enough for being a part of this. Uh, our panelists, um, I can tell you, I thought I knew a lot. I know even more tonight. Um, and I don't like to um, have people think that I favor one over the other, but I can't say enough about the work that Block Love does. And so for those of you who um, want to volunteer and help support their cause, I wish you would do that. I want to say thank you to uh, all the participants who cared enough to participate in this um, event and to our partners in the media. I sometimes have some not so nice things to say about them, but they were here tonight and they're going to help spread the word about what Mecklenburg County and its citizens are doing to help our homeless population. So this has been a good night. I said earlier, I wanted three things to come out of this event. One, for people to have a better understanding about what is happening in Mecklenburg County, for us to find ways to help address the issue, and I wanted people to have tangible things to take away. And I think we've accomplished that tonight. 
I still feel that um, one of the things that we can do is have better coordination of the services that are being provided. And we're going to work on that. I think the questions that were raised, even those that didn't get answered tonight, will eventually be answered so that this entire community who has a concern will be able to participate in a more meaningful way. Again, this has been a great night. Thank you all for your participation. And I'll turn it back over to Robert. Chairman Dunlap, thank you. Thank you for those remarks. And um, and just as 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 you and County Manager Diorio shared, just a huge thank you to the panelists tonight who came and on top of out there serving all day in the community and came and joined us tonight to be part of this conversation. Um, to all the elected officials who joined in from from our community and even even at the state level for participating tonight and, and joining in, and. Also, to people working behind the scenes, I really want to give a, a special recognition and acknowledgement to Courtney LaCaria and Karen Pelletier and Pam Escobar and Daniel Scudder, who really helped all of this run tonight. I know we had some bumps in the beginning, but the, really the team helped to make sure things things flowed smoothly from there. Um, just so excited about all of the questions that were raised and even the ones we weren't able to get to tonight. I, as, as you shared, Chairman Dunlap, I'm confident that that those questions can be answered um, over time. Uh, hopefully, this co conversation is one that can continue even after tonight, because that's that's really what's so important. All of us working together to continue this this commitment to to reducing and ending homelessness ultimately in our community. So with that, uh, we can close out for the evening. And I, I do want to thank everyone again for joining tonight and, and for your questions and your participation. And we look forward to, to reconnecting with you down the road. So thank you again, everyone. And I, I hope you all have a, a good evening.